If you know what I'm doing with the microphone right now, you went to a lot of hardcore shows when you were a teenager and now you have tinnitus. <laughs> um, hello, welcome to Astronomy on Tap, Halloween edition number 52. That was not nearly spooky enough. Can you do that again, Ms. Kavir? Wonderful. Okay. Um, my name is Soy Boy. I will be your host for the evening. Um, the reason I have a goofy name is because I'm a drag king, and I promise I usually look like a real boy, but um, everyone has a skeleton inside of them, okay? So this counts. Um, no, but drag is changing anyway. I mean, if you've ever seen any Gen Z drag artists, they're like not only totally skewing gender entirely, but they're like, you know what? Forget being human. And their stage name is like an unintelligible assortment of eldritch creepy voices. <laughs> so this counts. <laughs> anyway, welcome to Astronomy on Tap number 52. I'm very excited to be here. I love outer space. Um, before I continue, because this greatly impacts the type of language I use or jokes I tell later, is anyone here under 18? Fuck oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Um, so, this is a science outreach event. We will be talking to you about astronomy. Um, so, it was free. You were not charged to cover at the door. So if you'd like to support the Grand Stafford, 
please buy drinks at the bar. If you buy drinks at the bar, please generously tip your bartender. And if you like the science content, please go to that table over there and donate in exchange for some cool merch. There are some very cool mugs in particular that I have seen that are very, very cool and very, very worth the donation. Uh, the other way you can donate tonight is by tipping me. This is a science outreach event once again, but because I am hosting, this is also now a drag show, and I do love your dollar bills, so I will accept them. But instead of keeping them at the end of the night, I will put them in the AOT donation box. All right. So we have a very exciting lineup for you tonight. We have spooky talks. We have spooky trivia. We have a spooky costume contest. We have... The entire thing is spooky. So without further ado, would you like me to shut the fuck up and listen to someone else not shut the fuck up? <laughs> no, that was lame, you guys. Come on. Do it again. Without further without further ado, please for please ooh, hard. Please welcome our first speaker, who was the number five ranked yodeler in the world at the age of 15, Kayla Romain. Amazing. Thank you. I was not the top five yodelers at the uh, actually, I can't do it anymore. I just randomly taught my son. Pretty good. Sounds great. No, this is not working. Three fingers slide. I'm trying. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay, so you guys can do this. So, hi, I'm going to be talking about monsters in space. For those of you who don't know, my name is Kayla. I am a technically a second year astronomy PhD student, but I've only been here for like half a year, so numbers are weird. But, anyways, I'm going to be talking about monsters in space. So first off, what kinds of monsters are there in port? Does anyone have any like favorite monsters that they want to give like a little shout out to? Yeah, yeah those are those are very good ones. I definitely heard um, little monsters. Little monsters are also really good. I, I definitely heard giants. So like as the name suggests, these are very massive. So the one that I have a picture of is from one of my favorite horror movies. Um, and then suddenly I can't remember the name. Oh, Cloverfield. There we go. Um, but basically, if you haven't seen this movie, this like single mother and her millions of babies take on New York. It's like really wholesome. We recommend. But uh, giants come in different shapes and sizes, so you don't have to be like towering over buildings to be a giant. You could be an irradiated ant and still be considered a giant. Um, but this is not the only types of monsters. We also have monsters that are like folklore creatures. These are ones that are told in stories. So here I have the the kraken. This is like a sailor, like war creature basically just like out of vendetta against ships but um and then finally i have serial killers um and this one's self-explanatory so i don't have any pictures besides a cute little mask um but anyways let's talk about giants so before i talk about giants i have to explain something about scaling because the things that i'm going to be talking about are very massive and it's very difficult to understand just the sheer size of them so we try to scale them down with sizes that we can basically comprehend. So one of the ways that we do this is by scaling down with the sun. And so the sun has a radius of about seven times 10 to eight meters and a mass of two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. But we don't like to say that. We just like to say one solar radius, one solar mass. A lot much more easier to understand and also say. Um, and that little subscript of a circle with a dot means the sun. Um, but I'm going to be talking about exoplanets as well, and exoplanets are relatively smaller than the sun, so we can compare it with another object in our solar system, that is Jupiter. So Jupiter has a radius of 7 times 10 to the 7 meters, and a mass of 2 times, two times 10 to the 27 kilograms, but like I just showed, they're very difficult to say, so if you just say 1 Jupiter radius and 1 Jupiter mass, so now we know that. We can talk about this exoplanet. It's conveniently named ED plus 2024 57B. This exoplanet is very difficult. Can you guys see? Yeah, it's like right here. Uh, I'll have a better picture of it in a second, but it was detected by the radial velocity method. And this just means that this massive gas giant is tugging on its host star, and we can detect that tug. And we just know that there is an exoplanet there. And this is going to be a, a gas giant. So think like Jupiter Saturn. Um, and it has a mass of about 55 times the mass of Jupiter, which is pretty large. But what's really interesting is that 
it's not that much bigger than Jupiter. And so I just put it in a giant category because he's a big, big boy. Um, but it's just basically the size of Jupiter. So it's just like a very dense object. Um, but to go even bigger, I'm going to be talking about R136A1. This is a blue supergiant. This is the tarantula nebula that's shown on the left. And if you zoom in inside the tarantula nebula all the way to that right image there and look at where that little knife is pointing, you get this star. It's called R136A1. It's really massive. It's about uh, the radius is 34 times the size of the sun, and its mass is about 196 solar masses. But that's very difficult to understand, like what is even 34 solar radii. So I have a little <laughs> handy little picture here. So on the left is the sun, and the little planet there is Mercury. This is not to scale because this is PowerPoint. Um, but if I were to pick up R136A1 and then drop it, as, or sorry, pick up the sun and then drop it R136A1, it would kind of sort of look like this. Um, where it wouldn't necessarily swallow Mercury, but uh, it would be really close to it, making it pretty hot, um, which is really interesting to think about the size of like this massive star. Um, but to go even larger, uh, I have to issue a warning because I'm going to be talking about galaxies and groups of galaxies. So just to let you guys know, insanely large numbers ahead. Um, so we're going to be talking about very big things. So. This image here, uh, if you focus on this giant blob here and you zoom in on it, you get this little like looking thing. This is called IC 1101. It's an elliptical galaxy. What's really interesting about this galaxy here is the diameter is about 400 to 5. There's like different papers that cite the diameter, but 400 to 500,000 light years across, which is insanely large. Um, for those of you who don't know what it means to have a diameter of 400 to 500,000 light years, Basically, if you wanted to travel from here to here and go the fastest possible speed, the speed of light, it would take you half a million years to get from one side to the other, um, which is pretty insane. And then, so if you want to compare the size to things that we know, like our neighboring galaxy Andromeda or our own galaxy, you can see that we're like just this tiny little speck. And I see 1101 is just this massive blob. Like we don't even compare, which is like pretty sad about us. It's pretty sad. But, um, you think that like this is massive, but I'm actually going to be talking about something that's even bigger than this, which is called the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. And I haven't actually next to the name, but I'll explain why. And so this is like a really weird picture, but basically what this is depicting is a galaxy cluster, which is just a group of galaxies. And what's interesting about this is it's 10 million light years across in diameter, which basically means that if you were a little photon and you wanted to travel to the other side just because, um, it would take 10 million, light, 10 million years to get across, which is like a very long time. Um, but what's interesting is the fact that, okay, yeah. So the size is well beyond what we have for the theoretical limit as a mass or the most massive size that clusters could be. Um, the most massive size we, uh, that we estimate that cluster can get is about like a little over the 10 of the size of this uh, galaxy cluster. But what's even more interesting is that the largest known cluster has only 830 galaxies and is 10% of the size. So just imagine how many galaxies could be within inside this cluster. Um, and I have the largest known cluster and then an asteroid next to this because we're not exactly sure if this is the largest structure in the universe, but we have technically observed things in it. We're just not sure if it's as large as it is, but I included it anyways. Um, so to kind of try to get a good sense of the size, I'm going to be talking about something that's a little bit more difficult by comparing it to the observable universe. Because basically, we can't see light that's older than the age of the universe. That's like 13 million years old. Um, and so the diameter of the observable universe is 93 billion light years. And so I know I said that the universe is 13 billion years old, but basically the universe is expanding, which is why the diameter of the observable universe is larger than that. Um, but basically, this means that that cluster is about 10% of that length, and that is like the largest thing ever. So that's like incomprehensible size. And so you may wonder, like, how did we go about discovering something that massive? And so here, yeah, hopefully, like, this is like, does it play? Oh, my God, it plays. Okay, so what's really important is the little image on the right. And so here, let me see if this will work. Hold on. Okay. So what we observe is, if you look on the right image, that flat picture, where we're basically looking at a bunch of galaxies and we're like, hold on, these are like really close together. And then so we measure the distances from us to these galaxies. And then hold on, wait, where did my cursor? Oh, there it is. 
And then so we measure the distances from us to these galaxies, and we find that not only are they close together, but they're close to each other. And so we say that, okay, these are gravitationally bound to each other, and they must be a part of a cluster. But what's even more interesting is that these red dots are not just galaxy points, they're measurements of gamma ray bursts. And I'll explain what gamma ray bursts are a little bit later, and I think someone else will talk about them later. Um, but essentially, these events shouldn't be this close together. Um, and so what they're trying to say is because there's so many of these events and they're very tightly packed, we assume that they're a part of a very massive structure. And so that's why they're trying to argue that this basically massive cluster exists, but still the size is like very insane. So to try to cool off from all of these insanely massive sizes, we're going to be talking about folklore creatures. So let's go down to something a little bit uh, more close to our solar neighborhood and let's talk about viewer cloud. So here's an image of our solar system. And as you can see, the uh, axis, what am I the first one? Oh, here we go. So the axis here um, shows distance in terms of astronomical units, where the distance between the sun and the earth is one astronomical unit, another like scaling thing to try to make our lives easier. But the Oort cloud is well beyond uh, what we think is the edges of our solar system, like well beyond Pluto and the Kuiper belt. Um, and what we have here, here, let me get a better image of this. So here's the total image. So here we have our solar system. And then here we have the Kuiper belt. These are where comets come from. And then if you look a little bit further beyond, that is the Oort cloud. So this entire structure is like a blob of, like literally a cloud of comets. And so, oh wait, I guess I jumped ahead of myself. So yeah, what's inside the Oort cloud? It's a like, ton of comets. And so this was theorized in 1950 by Jan Oort. I honestly think that's a really weird last name. But anyways, so the reason that we came up or they came up with the Oort cloud is, is because it could explain the orbits of comets that had really long periods in the newly eccentric orbits. So basically they were seeing comets that have periods of over 200 years and they couldn't possibly come from the Kuiper belt. So that's where the Oort cloud comes in. And so the, the sphere shape of the Oort cloud can actually be explained by the uh, current understanding of the way our solar system was formed. Basically, uh, in the early formation of our solar system, basically it was just uh, uh, little planetesimals that were shot out by the gas giants in our solar system. And so that's why they're like all sporadically uh, distributed and not like hidden even belt distribution. So, yeah. But the thing is, is like, if we're like pretty sure that it's there, why have we not observed it? And I think a really good explanation for this is because astronomers don't count sheep at night, they count photons. And, and, and there's absolutely no photons coming from the Oort cloud. It's not only like very dark, but also very small objects and very difficult to detect. So we can't, we can't find it. It's very hard. Like, I think I'm finding, was it? A needle and haystack. There you go. <laughs> um, so next thing I'm going to be talking about is something that not a lot of people know about, and that is the white hole. So this idea was created in 1964 by Igor Novikov, and so it is quite literally, as the name suggests, the exact opposite of a black hole. So instead of you having like this very, uh, this object with so much like gravitational attraction that nothing can escape, like not even light, it's just basically like a, a glorified like space flashlight. So yeah, and so there's different theories about the way that this object behaves. Um, so one of the ideas is that it behaves as a wormhole. So basically, so instead of like you're traveling through space and you want to get from point A to point B, but you don't want to go through this entire path because it takes long, the wormhole is like a shortcut in space. And so one of the ideas is that it kind of behaves like this, where it's on the other side of the black hole. Um, but there's another interesting or one another idea that I thought was really interesting is that it's basically the inside out version of a black hole where essentially black holes shrink over time because of uh, hot radiation and they're losing energy. And so basically when it gets to the point where it shrinks so small, it's possibly a really difficult explanation, but like quantum effects take over, it just kind of pops out like a popper. At least like, I understood it basically just turns into a white hole. But that was weird because I'm like, why haven't we seen it? It was just this massive flashlight. But anyways, the other theory that I thought was really interesting and really weird is that Essentially, every black hole bursts another universe. So basically, like the singularity creates a big bang and output it is uh, like in another universe, which is uh, it's fully applied to like supermassive black holes, I think, but it's just like a weird concept to think about. And I don't want to think about it any further. <laughs> um, and then finally, I'm going to talk talking about serial killers. Now I'm going to be thinking, what the heck is she going to go with this? But here is serial killers in this picture. Anyone can guess? Anyone? Huh? 
No, the CO2 is actually the sun. <laughs> Um, and then also in here you have the sky, the nice sky, it's very peaceful, but there's actually like little serial killers everywhere. And you're thinking, what the heck is this girl on? But uh, we're going to be talking about something really interesting about the sun, and that is the fact that it has coronal mass ejections, where basically the sun and earth, these uh, events are caused by twisting and align or realignment of the sun's magnetic field. Basically, it creates these huge bubbles and it just pushes out material of the sun. Now, the, what's interesting about these events is that they actually are responsible for the events that give us our northern lights, which obviously we all really love, know and love. But the thing is, is that what does this do to us? So let's say you're a little astronaut, but you're in the, um, you're on the Earth or something, and you're like really close to the Earth, and you're still within the magnetic field, and there's a coronal mass ejection coming your way. What happens? Well, you're protected because the Earth's magnetic field shields you from any of the materials from the coronal mass ejection. But Let's say not on Earth. Maybe you're just randomly floating in space for some random meeting or reason. And then, you know, the coronal mass ejection happens. What happens to you? Well, what I found online, I thought was a really interesting piece of information that I didn't need in my head, but now I've memorized is that if you got hit with a coronal mass ejection with absolutely no protection, it would be equivalent to getting about 300,000 chest x rays at once. Where 45,000 chest x rays at once can kill you. And I didn't know what to do with that information, but I have to share it because I've memorized it now. So basically, instant death. <laughs> but I'm going to be talking about something else that's actually even more scarier. And so I need to give some like, background. Um, there's these objects in space called magnetars. And so there is existence which suggested in 1992 by Robert Duncan and Christopher Thompson, but they weren't exactly, or they weren't actually observed until July of 2008. Um, and basically what these are are neutron stars with the extremely powerful magnetic fields. And if you don't know what a neutron star is, basically it's just the leftovers of a very violent death of the star. It's just like the inside core of it. Um, but what's really interesting is the magnetic field is about 1,000 times that stronger of a neutron star and 100 million times that stronger of our own magnetic field. But what the heck does that mean? Well, I have a picture. So let's say you randomly found yourself 119,450 miles away from Magnetar for some like randomly. Well, for, from this distance, all information on your credit cards would be erased, which like, I don't know if you're having credit cards out here, but if you pass them out, but you know, give it a try. Um, but let's say you wanted to get closer for like some odd reason. So like, let's say if you wanted to get about less than 620 miles close to Magnetar, because you know, why not? Um, well, your atoms would be stretched out of shape, your molecular structure would disintegrate, and your body would just simply disappear. So, like, don't get less than 620 miles from Magnetar. Or maybe you, maybe life is hard, maybe you will. Anyways, <laughs> um, let's talk about Magnetar's gamma ray bursts because Magnetar's actually emit large bursts of well, technically gamma rays and X rays, but I'm going to specifically be talking about gamma rays. But they release this energy at irregular intervals. And so here I have a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum where I just wanted to show that like gamma ray is the most powerful type of radiation that could possibly like exist. So I'm going to actually get into that a little bit later. So basically the second most powerful gamma ray burst was detected actually from two spacecrafts in 1978. And this is how the theory of magnetars ended up being created. Where basically spacecraft detects about 100 uh, photons of gamma rays per second, where this suddenly changed to 200,000 counts per second in a fraction of a millisecond, which was incredibly fast and a lot of radiation. Um, so now we put it in two ways that we can maybe understand as it what would happen if you got hit by this. And so let's say you're a little man, once again, under the influence or inside the Earth's magnetic field, and you got hit with a gamma ray burst. Well, what would happen? Well, death. Um, so even on Earth, if you're not safe, the ozone layer would be damaged and you're just getting lethal doses of radiation. And simply put, you would all die. But, uh, don't worry, you don't need to like stay awake at night wondering if you'll get hit with a gamma ray burst because it's very rare and it would have to be like really close for us in like perfect conditions for it to happen. So don't worry. Um, but yeah, the end. That's it. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. So you were saying that the clusters of galaxies could be observed in like this pattern? Uh, yeah, here, let me try to go back to that picture for a second. Um, it was showing like a, you said that there. Yeah. So 
this image that you're showing where there's a cluster of galaxies, how did you determine that this is a cluster of galaxies or that this is something observable in its own, like, mm -hmm. like has a name for it? Like what are the outward dimensions that you're dealing with? Yeah, so um, for this cluster, they've observed about seven groups within it. So I was wondering if it might actually be a super cluster, but it's being labeled as a cluster right now. And so the way that we do it is, you know, let me see if I can get the, yeah. okay, there. So when you're looking at like an image of a bunch of galaxies, and you see like on the right here, you have a bunch of stuff lumped together, you suspect that this might be a candidate for a cluster. And then so you investigate it a little bit further, and then you try to measure the distances from us to these clusters. Um, or to these galaxies, sorry. And then what you find is that with respect to each other, they're close. So what you originally see from the other angle is a flat image, but if you look at it from a different direction, you see that these are like really close together with respect to each other. And we've observed like, I think it was like five different groups of these. And so we suspect that because they're not only so close to each other that they should be gravitationally bound, but we've also uh, observed several groups that they must be like part of each other, also tied in with the whole gamma reverse thing. Um, so that they're all like part of this massive structure. Um, so that's why they suspect that not only is this like a cluster, but it's a very massive one. What makes them gravitationally bound? They're like close enough to each other. That just yeah, so like um like the way that we're gravitationally bound inside our solar system is like you're close enough to feel the influence of gravity from your other partners, essentially. Yeah. Uh yes. So uh Plasma reacts to like magnetic fields. Yeah. Uh, what would happen if like a star came pretty close to a neutron or a magnetic? Um, so not thinking about the gravity thing. So the magnets are uh their magnetic fields is actually even more powerful than that of like the sun. So I can imagine some sort of like weird magnetic thing happening, but like in terms of like those kinds of physics, I'm not gonna answer and say, yeah, this is it for sure. But it would definitely be something weird because this magnetic field is powerful, more powerful than the sun. It's a really dense object. So it definitely be something weird that would happen if they got too close together. Yeah. Anything else? I thought there were a lot of scary things about that talk. Uh, personally, I think the scariest part was the very large numbers. Um, I don't know about you, I scale a lot of numbers for the time, so it was a deep existential dread. And I, for one, certainly will not be sleeping tonight. So thank you, Kayla. <laughs> um, before we go on to our next segment, I'd like to take a moment to talk about my drink. It is the cutest little thing. I asked our lovely bartender for something strong and gin based, and this is what he made me. Uh, it is the special drink for AOT for tonight, and I can confirm it is delicious. And if I keep drinking these, I will get messed up because it does not taste strong. <laughs> so I encourage you all to go get one. Also, I love the juxtaposition of a spooky, scary skeleton drinking the <laughs> cutest tiny pink drink. <laughs> With sparkles. Yeah, it's sparkly too. <laughs> thank you for genuinely thank you for reminding me. I was about to thank you for reminding me and not say genuinely, but then I realized that would sound like I was sassing you, but I wasn't. It is sparkly. <laughs> All right. On to our next segment. Okay. I need to take this glove off. Because laptops don't work like that. It's trivia time. Yes, it is trivia time. Wait, Micah, help. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Ah, yes. Okay, you know what? I'm leaving my skeleton club off. The other one ran out of battery. So it is time for trivia. Do we have trivia sheets? Raise your hand. 
Raise your hand if you would like a trivia sheet. I love bar trivia, you guys. Um, also, a reminder to write on your trivia sheet suggestions for drink things. All right, while those are being passed out, I'm going to talk to you about how much I love bar trivia. I'm really mad, but once it was my birthday party one year, I just went to a bar, my friends, to do trivia, and one of my other friends won the entire trivia for, I mean, he got third place, but she was like, right and I was so psyched it was like the best night of my life I hope I have another night in that one day are all the sheets passed out I'm gonna start question one planet HD B which NASA dubbed Slasher Planet, has what spooky characteristic? A, it has clouds laced with gas that swirl around at 5,400 miles per hour. B, it survived a trip into its sun and came out the other side. Or C, it is shrouded in complete darkness due to its incredibly opaque atmosphere. All right, do you guys want me to repeat those options or move on? Move on. Question two. Known as IC2118, this nebula glows by reflecting light from the star Rigel. But what is another name for this nebula? A, the vampiric gas nebula. B, the green cat nebula. Or C, the witch head nebula. Or D, the, the screaming nebula. Wonderful. Is this the picture of that nebula? It is. Yes. Can you do the first question? Yes. Question one repeated. Planet HD which NASA dubbed Slasher Planet, has what spooky characteristic? A. It's clouds laced with gas. It has clouds laced with gas that swirl around at 5,400 miles per hour. B, it survived a trip into its sun and came out the other side. Or C, it is shrouded in complete darkness due to its incredibly opaque atmosphere. Good? Cool, cool. All right, I'm going to skip to question three unless there are any objections. Question three, which one of the following is not a name of one of these nebulae? A, the ghost nebula. B, the ghost head nebula. C, the little ghost nebula. Or D, the ghost eye nebula. Good. Onward. Onward. Also, sorry, I totally can't hear anything because I have a swing cap over my ears. Um, it is blue there, so I can't take it off. Um, question four, when does a full moon occur? A, when the moon is on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. B, when the moon is between the earth and the sun. C, when the moon is perpendicular to the earth and the sun, or D, when enough werewolves gather in one place to summon it. I think we all know the correct answer here. I'm going to just continue. Question five. This famous image of the Perseus cluster was observed in what part of the electromagnetic spectrum? A, gamma rays. B, x-rays. C, Spooky rays, or D, the screaming skull wavelength. Question 
Cool. I saw most of you write something down. Question six. This image of an object in space was taken by Arecibo Observatory and found to look a bit like a skull. But what is it? A, is it an asteroid? B, is it a comet? C, a planet? Or D, a space skull left behind by giant aliens? Once again, I think the answer is obvious. Let's move on. <laughs> Question seven. What is another name for Nebula NGC 246? A, the zombie nebula. B, the skull nebula. C, the scary blob nebula. Or D, the Frankenstein nebula. Genuinely, this one is not obvious to me. Um, question eight. What is shown in the following Hubble Space Telescope image? A. This actually isn't an HST image. It is the Io Sauron of Lord of the Rings. B. It is a nebula left behind by a supernova. C. It is a debris disk around a star. Or D. It is an alien space station made of broken glass. Cool. <laughs> Question nine, we have two more questions. Stay sharp, y'all, like that broken glass from the last question. This nebula's distinct shape is caused by stellar radiation and winds blowing out gas and dust. But what is the nebula called? A, the Twin Claw Nebula, B, the Many-Legged Nebula, C, the Black Widow Nebula, or D, the Killer Crab Nebula. Personally, I don't see the difference between B and C because spiders have too many legs. Yeah. Our last question, question 10. So the infamous face on Mars image shows evidence for what on the surface of Mars? A, aliens. B, ghosts. C, zombies. Or D, a pile of rocks. All of the above. Thank you. All right. Would you like me to go through those again? No. Yes. If you would like the question repeated, raise your hand. Otherwise, I will not repeat the question. Cool. I don't know how to use Max. You got it. You got it. <laughs> um, our next segment is what? Yes. Write your name on the back of the chart. Yeah, the like the magic break. And answer the questions on the back. What? Anyway, it's time for one of our regular segments. It is What's Up by Gaswan de Veraconda, who, fun fact, holds the world record for number of committees sat on by a graduate student. You're not wrong. Unfortunately, <laughs> there is. Crush it. Yeah. What's up? All right, this is a regular song where we talk about what's up in the sky, what's in the next month. Um, some fun, great stuff we're going up this next month. Uh, there's gonna be lunar eclipse. <clears throat> uh, you're that sort of thing on November 8th. You gotta wake up, ask really though, that's how it starts at 4 16 in the morning. 
and then the peak will be at 5 a.m. and about 541 a.m. Um, but with this overall Texas and most of the constants in the United States, so that'll be one thing. So make sure we have early for that. Fun fact for y'all, the uh, solar eclipse in around 270 BCE was observed by this Greek guy or Starbus, and based on duration of the eclipse, this will figure out the distance and the size of the moon way back when. Um, so cool, I'm sorry. Uh, some people like to call these uh, lunar eclipses the blood moon. The reason for the blood moon is that even though all of the light from the sun is blocked by the Earth, some of the light goes through the Earth's atmosphere and then bounces off the moon. So it's simply a red light. So red light um, gets refracted through, so light from the wavelengths can interact with the moon differently. You've all seen the big toy dark side of the moon image. Um, so the red light gets bent towards the moon, blue lights get scattered away from the moon. And so as a result, the only thing you see off the moon is this red light that's technically scattered from three the and upwards, something's called earth shine. So it's this scary blood red blood so that start to call the blood moon. Um, only eight days after the moon. Uh, the other fun thing coming up soon is that Uranus is going to be in opposition. So, great time to look up Uranus. Uh, <laughs> basically, when an object is directly um, opposite, well, so there's the sun, the Uranus, and the objects, and it's close to Uranus. Uh, it'll be at opposition on November 9th, um, so the day after the lunar eclipse. Um, but, you know, it'll be that's too far. It'll be uh, at the current price that's ever been this entire year, right around then. Um, so it'll be great to look at it. Uh, unfortunately, because it's the day after the moon, uh, the lunar eclipse, that also the moon is close to all, so it'll be really, really black and black, you know, for uh, So, what you won't gonna want to do is go to a dark site, you need a dark site, to see this, it's for faint. Get a pair of blockers or a telescope. Um, because it's it's bright, but it's not that bright. It's very really just which one? Yes. Um, so on November 9th, salt will be pretty close to the moon. So it's up here. Here is where Uranus is going to be. Here is the constellation of Aries. This is the constellation of Taurus. So the Pleiades is a very famous cluster of stars that gets very easy to find. Um, so on November 9th, we will have red to the Aries and the Pleiades, and we're going to start here. On every other night, the moon will be somewhere else, but at least I can find the Pleiades and Aries and the four Aries uh, right there. Um, and if you have a hand in star chart, then you can basically go, all right, which one of these can be dots? Those we drop in the star chart, it's probably going to be this. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the drama. It's a great time to look at the drama of the dots. The next one will be almost directly over your head, right around midnight. So it's really great to look at. Uh, and it's huge, right? So this is, uh, if you could see it in drama from the naked eye, um, this is basically how like, you're how big of like all sorts of everything else is it's just huge, um, very difficult to capture. Um, so it's also most of the light is very really hard to see with the kind of guy or even with a telescope unless you have a camera ready to capture them and make sure these really long exposures. So this is a more advanced thing to do once painting out the photography. Um, fun fact, Andromeda is about 25 percent larger than what weighed by stellar mass. There's about 25 percent more stars in Andromeda. It's also bigger in terms of total size. But we think the Milky Way has more dark because we can measure the uh, velocities of the stars and drawn them as well as velocities of the stellar velocities of the Milky Way. And the Milky Way seems to um, spin much quicker. So it's an instant in the Milky Way actually has more dark matter. But Andromeda has more baryonic matter or the stellar matter. Um, and that, my friends, is what's up. Any questions? Dark site? Yeah. Uh, there are near my dark sites, you can see which destination is dark sites, the closest one in the hands on which you consider to be up to and follow for the dark sites. Uh, there's one, you know, in terms of models, we're going to get my cost to go to bits of the effective websites. There's also, I mean, for Uranus, you don't actually have to go to that far. It's not like it's kind of bits of inside times, and that's just on the next one easily. Uh, same with the drama, like bits of inside times. The closest, like, you need to bring the dark site is the next one.
I actually have a question for you. Ask Martha. Um, is Uranus at opposition like when Mercury is in Gatorade? <laughs> um, Nobody cares about Mercury. <laughs> Um, okay, it's time for our break. Uh, trivia will be collected at the end, and I'm going to try to learn to use this computer. And Yes, I remember. If you're done with trivia, just like the earth or the summit for it. And so I'm glad it's day. And a long time. I stopped working here. Anyway, he was always like on call. I'll be there right now because we needed that. And I see so it was dropped out of it. It's the printing. It was pretty clean. And that's their Well, here's a hard copy. Error number one. Epsilon Rho Rho Omicron Rho. The number one that I can read it, but it's not a straight. Mark Phillips did this. How much did I delete? 
The way they did this instead of following the observatory is they said they fit some files with the header the, and the, the data, and that was a little bigger. And they were actually sort of two, two files with a connection, right? Yeah. And so, what one, one and so they go in different directions. You know, it's, it's sort of like an ancient way of doing it. When, when I started. But that that's the way they invent these things on the go. My people said, no, oh, this is a so what they what they did was what well they, 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 they were taking they were taking Oh, he didn't close it off. Or 
Well, I've already given you a Yeah, and the boy who was in the provider uh, 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 about to head out of bounds at the chat. And the cat I am So this cat did not instantly die. I stopped right there. I have a oh man. And then it then it hit the classic part. I, I call I got a bed on the phone. Because I had a I had a phone. That's the thing. I had a whatever phones we had in the vehicle for about yeah. So I called it bed and said, well bring that bad if we'll take a look at it, you have the same Well you did that, I said okay. <laughs> and it was safe. <laughs> Never mind, that's this. <laughs> Don't you worry if somebody would just like run over that dog. <laughs> My favorite mom in the bed. Hello, friends. Well, well, as have you all replenished your drinks and are you ready for the side of our show? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, trivia has been collected. Once again, your trivia has not been collected. Please raise it very high in the air. Um, we see one. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So I learned how to use the laptop, you guys. I really just don't know how to use Macs. Apparently, you're supposed to swipe with three fingers. Well, that's ridiculous. I didn't know that. I anyone would never have guessed that. So up next, we have another one of our regular segments in the news with Nico, who is a guy we could say is very passionate about galaxies. And also now has to explain the joke I just made. Uh, so you can explain that joke for yourself by following me on Twitter at Nico J. Cleary. I better get some notifications. All right. Uh, so this in the news, I'm going to be honest. I am very proud of this first story. Uh, I genuinely think that this might be the best in the news story that I've ever given in my like year of doing in the news at this point. So we're going to talk about black hole gas reflexes. Um, so here's a nice pretty picture. What you see here is on the left, you have some large gravitational mass where uh, you have stuff that is spiraling into it 
getting ripped apart. You have these ejecta, these jets uh, that are throwing out a bunch of energy. Um, and so in 2018, uh, there was what's called a tidal disruption event, which is basically when a black hole uh, swallows a bunch of stuff, you get big uh, tidal disruption tails, tidal tails, um, as it's relativistically dragging uh, everything at super high speeds, ripping it all apart. Uh, and there have been events in the past where you have a black hole that swallows something and then it throws out a jet with a little bit of a delay. Uh, this story that I have for you is the longest time delay that has ever been observed between a tidal disruption event uh, and an outflow event. So seeing these jets, and I'll explain why this is so cool after my single favorite analogy that I've ever given in, in the news. So if you have a dog, you've seen something like this before. And so, as we all know, dogs are black holes. <laughs> and toys uh, are things that are being ripped uh, things that are being ripped apart by the dog. They are like stars being ripped apart by black holes. And if I if I just flip back real quick uh, to this picture, so a lot of these stuffed animal toys, uh, so they're soft, so they flop around. That's kind of it's kind of what your tidal tails are. Uh, it's not just staying rigid with the dog. So as the dog whips its head around, uh, the toy flops around with it. But also, this chip in particular is maybe the best example that I could have ever found with it. Uh, this because it also has a very physically accurate ejecta. <laughs> so all of the stuffing that flies out of the star that gets thrown away from the dog. Uh, is basically all of the stuff that gets chucked out after the black hole swallows the star. Thank you very much. That was the best analogy that I've ever given. Nice. Um, so in 2018, there was this title disruption event observed where a black hole swallowed a star uh, and basically didn't do much. And then three years later, uh, it was observed to have uh, outflows again after having literally no activity. And this is really weird. Usually we expect to see this outflow activity uh, very shortly if there is any delay. So like hours or days, not three years. So we have no idea what the hell happened, uh, why uh, anything like this happened. And this is strictly a sample size of one. Uh, we've never seen anything like this before. Uh, but what's also really cool is that you can basically uh, from uh, from <laughs> happening to point your telescopes at this at the time of the outflow, um, if you're lucky, you get to measure the velocity of the ejecta. And so normally uh, these things have speeds. So this like outflowing gas has speeds like 10% the speed of light. This is going ridiculously fast. Like 10% the speed of light is pretty quick. Uh, this is going like half the speed of light, which is insane. Uh, we have never seen anything like this event before. Question. Yes. So, so what's the gamma ray flux from a dog ripping apart a stuffed animal? Uh, Low, I imagine. Gamma ray expert added in the back of the room. What is the gamma rate? What is the counts per second that an observer? I'm going to form this question even better. Uh, what is the counts per second of an observer uh, that an observer would see of a dog ripping apart a toy if you were however many million light years away or however many thousand light years away? Yes, the gamma rays. Very scientific answer. From a dog. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so as I always like to do with the news, I have a couple of short, uh, let's look at some pretty pictures kind of stories. So, thank you. Uh, so JWST, as uh, I've said several times throughout my tenure as your in the news speaker, you will never escape JWST when I'm talking. Uh, so what we see here is just this really insane image. I hope it shows up well enough on this projector for you all to see this. 
Uh, in the center of this image, you have a binary of two very massive stars. Uh, one of them is about 30 times the mass of the sun. One of them started as about 20, 25 times the mass of the sun, uh, but it's really special. It's something that's called a wolf ray star. And basically that means that it's ripping itself apart and chucking off a bunch of its outer mass. And you can actually see uh, these ripples as these uh, as this binary, uh, as these two stars orbit around each other, um, you see these ripples, basically just these pressure waves of the wolf ray star uh, chucking out half of itself. So it started off as something like 20, 25 solar masses. Uh, it's expected that it now has a mass of about uh, 10 times that of our sun. So it is throwing out 10 solar masses worth of stuff in these rings, and it's really pretty. This is Halloween. Uh, this is the Halloween AOT. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about uh, some scary stuff. This, both this story and the next are uh, pretty spooky for different reasons. Um, one of our favorite topics on uh, the AOT stage is, of course, broccoli, right? Uh, so aliens, we talk about aliens all the time. Um, a recent <laughs> right, it's broccoli is very scary. Uh, eat your vegetables, kids. So uh, in this new study, there was a proposal to search for extraterrestrial life using broccoli. Not quite. Um, so, so a lot of plants, well, basically all plants, I don't know why broccoli was the one in particular <laughs> that they were talking about, um, but uh, a large amount of plants on the earth emit this chemical that's called methyl bromide. Uh, it's this very short-lived chemical uh, basically from uh, the feeding of plants on the earth. And in quote-unquote normal searches for aliens, we look for things uh, like other biosignatures of uh, human and other life, things like methane, CO2, water, all that kind of stuff. Methyl bromide is interesting because one, it's really the only way that it's produced that it's known is by living things on Earth. Uh, and two, it's very short-lived. So if you see methyl bromide uh, as a chemical signature in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, it's uh, a pretty good sign that there is life that is active there, not just there was life at some point. Uh, and so you might be asking, uh, that's great, but haven't seen any, the answer is no. Uh, but uh, the reason why I bring this up and why I think it's so interesting is uh, a lot of next generation instruments for uh, SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, um, and search for extraterrestrial life uh, uh, instruments on telescopes, I think that was redundant, whatever, um, are being specifically made to look for this methyl bromide. Uh, so when we discover aliens in the next several, de several decades, uh, you can thank broccoli for that. <laughs> and our final story, uh, Kayla, yeah, pay attention. Um, Kayla talked about the second brightest gamma ray burst ever recorded by humans. I am going to talk to you about the brightest gamma ray burst ever recorded by humans. And guess what? Uh, we're all gonna die. Uh, sorry, <laughs> hate to break it to you. Um, but gamma rays will kill us all. Uh, this is an animation from the Fermi Lat telescope. Uh, Addy, our gamma ray expert in the back, will tell you all about Fermi. Um, Taken of this event that happened a few weeks ago. Uh, with this very long phone book name, whatever, who cares? Uh, but very briefly, this little, little blob uh, was brighter in gamma rays than our galaxy was to us. And it's 2 billion light years away. So this stripe, this diagonal stripe here is the Milky Way. And this little dot that is uh, dimming and growing and dimming and growing is this gamma ray burst. So basically something happened, uh, whether it's like a neutron star binary or supernova or something funky happened that emitted a ton of high energy radiation, um, but like a ridiculous amount. So like I said, this thing was 2 billion light years away. 
that sounds bar, it's actually the closest of any of these events that we've ever seen. Uh, and as such, it was the brightest. Uh, in events like this, uh, there's the amount of radiation, there's the amount of energy radiated from these events uh, in a very short time scale, like literally seconds, as the sun will emit in its entire life. Uh, yeah, just, just think about that. Um, and one, one thing that I, like, the reason why I picked this story was, uh, you know, one of the biggest, brightest thing, whatever, um, but it was actually measurable by lightning rods, like human meteorological instruments uh, to measure things about our weather on the planet could measure this gamma ray burst two billion light years away. Uh, and I think that is both incredible and terrifying because imagine if this thing was closer to us. And uh, on that existential dread, that's in the news. Thank you very much. Any questions? Do we have any idea of what the galaxy is came from, or do we have other examples? Uh, what galaxy? I do not know off the top of my head. It's not very far, so it's like, well, I would say local universe. Other people would argue with me. I don't know. Like all these galaxies, just have like phone book names. It's just and you see blah 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 blah. Uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, we definitely know. Like. We, we can say, hey, it's right there. Look in the area of that thing or what else is right there. How close would a gamma ray burst be for to kill all of us? How close would a gamma ray burst have to be for to kill all of us? Uh, very close astronomically, very far in human terms. Uh, I mean, if this was 2 billion light years away and it was enough to affect our electronics, um, not like a whole lot closer for it to like at least shut down uh, a lot of human electronic equipment. Maybe not just like straight up kill us. Go for it. If this was a two billion light years away, if you had, if, if there's a galaxy like pretty close to Scamper right there, but it like kill a whole bunch of life if life exists in the galaxy. Yeah, so so the question was if, uh, so this is pretty far away, it's two billion light years away. If there was something like a galaxy that was right next to this, uh, would it do a lot of damage? The answer is yeah, absolutely. Um, it would mess up a lot of, if there was living stuff that was like us, it would mess up a lot of stuff. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. That was in the news. Thank you. You know, I don't even have like a joke to make about that because the, the dog thing, honestly, that was just fucking impeccable. So good job. Um, so I kind of lied to you all by omission earlier. Uh, and I'm sorry about that. Actually, I'm not, but I did lie to you by omission. Um, I introduced myself as Soy Boy the Drag King, and that is true, but I kind of made it sound like, you know, AOT reached out to me separately. Um, that's not true. I'm also a grad student here. Um, but if you ask me what I study, it kind of depends on how I want the rest of the conversation to go. <laughs> if someone asks me what I study and I say astronomy, that means I want the conversation to continue, right? Because if you say astronomy, everyone's like, wow, that's so cool. I can look up in the sky too. I love space. And I'm like, fuck yeah, me too, I love space. And we nerd out about it. On the other hand, if I say astrophysics, that's when I want the conversation to end ASAP because <laughs> Then whoever I'm speaking to is like, oh my God, this person only speaks in the language of calculus and has no social skills. I better <laughs> fuck get out of here right now. So anyway, I study astrophysics. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but now I always love the in the news segment with Nico because astronomy always has so many like amazing things going on. And for some reason, every month there's like this incredible black hole thing. Uh, the one that really stuck with me is a while ago, there was a team of astronomers who took a picture of the black hole in the center of the galaxy M87. Like, this was a big deal because it was the first time that a black hole had been imaged directly. So it's like if I stood up here with a camera, took a picture of you all, that's what they did with the black hole, but like way bigger. And I feel really honored and it's special to be a part of a field that felt so collectively insecure that it spent millions of dollars to take the world's largest hole in it. That was the joke that I wasn't going to tell if there was someone under it. <laughs> All right. We have one more invited talk of the night. Our next speaker is Frank Wong, who is notorious for mixing up his left and right. So much so that when he went to go get a tattoo of it to remind himself, it came out wrong. <laughs> Hang on a second, sorry. <laughs> How to do that. I forgot what to swipe. But I still don't know how to use the computer. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Hi everyone, I'm Frank. I'm a first year grad student studying astronomy here at Texas A&M. And tonight, in the spirit of Halloween, I'm really excited to talk to you all about things that go bump in the night. So we are going to be looking at killer worlds and some stuff that we can't even begin to understand. So I hope you're better with me and let's go through a pretty scary ride through our universe. Uh, and before I get started, you can follow me on social media. I'm on both Instagram and on Twitter, but I'm a little bit less well-behaved on Twitter, so just a disclaimer. Uh, so our first topic for today is killer worlds. And yeah, so some of you might be saying like, yeah, life on Earth, it's not always fantastic. You know, uh, we do have some pretty scary stuff happen right here on our home planet. Like uh, just yesterday, for example, we uh, had a warning that big balls of ice might be falling from the sky uh, earlier this month. Um, what, a big hurricane hit Florida? God knows what lives at the bottom of the sea, and probably worst of all, the state of Ohio exists. Yeah, yeah. And you probably didn't really like that one. Um, but, but anyways, yeah, life on Earth, it's not always that great, and a lot of people are trying to leave and are trying to find different planets. But the point that I'm gonna try to drive across to you all today is even though we're looking for these other planets, we live in a pretty special corner of our universe, and there are a ton of exoplanets out there that aren't as pretty. And our first example is PSR B1257 plus 12. It's a mouthful, so I'm not going to repeat it a whole lot tonight. But, uh, but uh, so this is an exoplanet system that's orbiting a pulsar, which I'll get into shortly. And a fun fact about this is that, um, well, about the system is that these were the three first exoplanets to ever be detected. Now they were detected in 90, 1992, which is a long time ago to me. I've only seen one member of the Royal Family die, but uh, <laughs> 1992 might not be such a long time ago to some of you in the audience, but I won't get too far into that. But before we get into the science, let's talk about what a pulsar is. So a pulsar is two kinds of special. First of all, it's a, a neutron star, which is basically the collapsed core of a supermassive star. And essentially, to the non-science folk in the audience, what that means is it's a dead star. And second of all, it's a pulsar. So that means it's rotating very, very quickly and shooting beams of electromagnetic ra radiation out of its poles. It's pretty well described in this GIF here, which I thought was really annoying, but I had to look at it, so all of you have to as well. <laughs> and 
Uh, yeah, so you already saw how annoying that gift was. So I'm sure some of you already would have wanted to live right next to that planet. Uh, it's like, imagine if you're in a dark room and someone's just shining a light on you, turning it on and off every millisecond or so. Pretty damn annoying. But I know there are some of you optimists out there in the audience thinking like, oh, you know, it's not so bad, Frank. Uh, after a while, I'll probably get somewhat used to it. And plus it's a free tan every millisecond or so. So in order to convince you, I'm going to ask a super technical and fundamental science question. Why, does, why do these planets suck? And while in order to drive that point home, I have another less annoying gift of another pulsar up here. It's not the pulsar impression, but it's enough to drive my point home. That there right here is called the crab pulsar. Does anyone in the audience want to have a guess on how far away that thing is? 15. 15, okay, 15, it, it's at least 15, but it's <laughs> 6,400 light years away. And that's pretty far. And it's still, you can still see that big of a change in brightness. So I sure as hell don't want to live anywhere close to a pulsar. You want me just getting a nice little tan? It's a pretty fucking heavy dose of radiation. Uh, but yeah, so pulsars, they're not so cool to live right next to, but they are really cool and useful astronomical objects. Uh, one thing about pulsars is we know exactly when their pulses are meant to arrive. We can time them to a very high degree of accuracy. And this is really useful. Uh, I actually learned, the, well, the astronomy students, we learned earlier this week that uh, certain organizations have a very high interest in pulsars. One of those organizations includes the U.S. Navy. So they actually use pulsars to help them with timing and navigation. Uh, but yeah. Cool objects, not so cool to live next to. Our next planet is HD 80606b, which NASA likes to call the roasted planet. And uh, in order to kind of figure out why it's roasted, uh, we do have to dive a little bit into orbital mechanics, which I will try to make as painless for you all as possible. And it's actually a fairly simple concept. Um, what you really want to know is this thing called eccentricity. And basically for at least a closed orbit, uh, eccentricity has values ranging from zero to one. Uh, the more, the closer you are to zero, the closer you are to being in a perfect, perfectly circular orbit. And the closer you are to one, the more elliptical your orbit. So to put things in context, the Earth's uh, orbit around the sun, it's got an eccentricity of a give or take 0 0.01. So it's pretty dang close to being a perfect circle. The roasted planet, however, is way up there where that pink ellipse is. It's, I think its eccentricity value is about 0 0.94. So it kind of orbits its, uh, its host star like a comet. Now, so some of you might be asking like, oh, Frank, I don't care. What does eccentricity have to do with this? Well, Eccentricity is important because it leads to a pretty big change in orbital velocity. So for example, say the host star is way up in the left side of the ellipse, then, uh, well, basically, if we're on the right side of the ellipse, we're going really slow. And if, as we get closer and closer to the host star on the left side of the ellipse, we're going really, really quick. And you know, it's pretty much like living on a roller coaster. You're at the very top, you're going pretty slow, and then all of a sudden you're zooming. But to me, uh, I mean, I hate roller coasters. Uh, my girlfriend thinks I'm a bit of a wimp. But uh, so that was enough to make me not want to live on this planet. But to some of you thrill seekers out there, I think we do have to ask the super technical and fundamental science question why does this planet suck? And basically, it's a lot to do with its eccentricity. So one, another thing that the eccentricity causes is a change in temperature. Uh, I know we're all smart people here, so the further you get from a hot object, it gets oh. Exactly. So because the orbit of this planet is so eccentric, um, it changes its distance to its host star fairly dramatically. And uh, scientists actually found that 
In a span as short as six hours, this planet can, draw, uh, can jump over 800 degrees Kelvin. And for all the uh, non-scientists and Americans in the audience, that is 1,000 Fahrenheit. But good news is this doesn't mean that uh, the Rosa planet was livable anyway. It's, it goes from, give or take, 1,000 Fahrenheit to 2,200 Fahrenheit in the space of maybe six hours or so. So it's kind of like living in Texas, never really gets cold. It just goes from being quite hot to extremely hot. Um, but yeah. So uh, another cool thing, well, I don't know about cool, but if that hasn't convinced you that this planet sucks to live on, uh, those changes in temperatures do lead to pretty significant weather, well, pretty crazy weather patterns. So uh, has anyone here ever been to Chicago? Yeah, so if you've been there, it's pretty windy, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, might surprise you, but this planet, it's a little bit windier. The change in temperature, it triggers what scientists call uh, shockwave storms. And these shockwave storms have winds uh, going about three times the speed of sound. So that's about three miles a second. So besides from being super hot, well, it is, it's just a super hot, super windy planet, not that great to live on. And the point that I want to drive home is that we really do take this circular orbit for granted. Um, it's not, uh, not really something we notice, but it's definitely something that really helps us stay alive. All right, so I'm gonna pivot away from uh, exoplanets and start talking a little bit about the dark. Uh, basically, now I'm going to start talking about things that we don't, well, we don't really know what these are, but we know it's out there. And the first one of those things is dark matter. And Basically, some of you may be asking, well, Frank, what, uh, well, what's dark matter? What, what makes it any different to regular matter? And I think it might help as an exercise to kind of list out the things that we consider to be matter. And all of you will try to spot a pattern, uh, well, at least spot a thing that all these objects I'm going to list out uh, share. And uh, just, just as a disclaimer, I'm gonna go in ascending order. So the smallest of those are the chairs in this room. The chairs in this room are all matter, pretty small. Then you've got the planet we live on, the rocky crust, uh, the magma in our core, that's all matter. Um, then we have the sun, the sun in our sky, made primarily of hydrogen and helium, also matter. Uh, going even bigger, we have the Milky Way, if you drive a couple, well, the parts of the Milky Way that you can see. If you drive maybe like 40 minutes out into the country, you'll be able to see it pretty clearly. All you can see is matter. And probably the biggest one of all, your mom. <laughs> so uh, with all those things on, on the board, what do all of those things share in common? Anyone from the audience? You can see them, who said that? Thanks, Addy. Yes, you can see them. So all, all of these things, they interact with light. They either absorb, emit, reflect, that's about it, uh, some form of uh, electromagnetic radiation. We don't even have to be able to see it with our own eyes. It can be some sort of, uh, some other sort of electromagnetic radiation. And dark matter is just everything that we can't see easily. And so, some of you may be asking, well, if we can't see it, how do we find it? And I actually think this is a pretty cool story. You might not if you're normal, but uh, basically in the 1970s, this uh, fantastic astronomer, Vera Rubin, she wasn't even looking for dark matter. She was just kind of measuring the, how quickly a galaxy rotates. And basically she was trying to see, well, you know, uh, if I go a certain distance out from the galactic center, how fast will it rotate there? And uh, basically, what we would expect is the further out you get, the, uh, the slower you rotate because, you know, uh, gravity doesn't have as strong of an influence. Right? Right. Wrong. Basically, what we found is that uh, this, by the way, is called a rotation curve. And bas it's basically a measure of velocity uh, as a function of radius. And the further out you get, your velocity doesn't really seem to decrease. And uh, 
So Barrett Logan decided, well, there has to be something driving that uh, increase of velocity, and let, let's figure out what it is. And uh, 50 years later, we still don't really have that good of an idea. So I personally don't know exactly what dark matter is, but I can't give you a summary of uh, some of the things that we think it might be. Uh, there are two big categories, and one of them, the first one is MACHOs, which stands for Massive Astrophysical Compact Halo Objects. And these are basically things made of baryonic matter, which is which are the chairs you're sitting on. Uh, they're everything made out of protons and neutrons. They're just very, very, very difficult for us to see. So examples include uh, black holes, uh, really small stars, and maybe even Jupiter-sized planets uh, orbiting them, that they just don't really interact or do anything with light. Uh, this last one is a little bit controversial, but I think I look pretty macho in that photo up there. Uh, but yeah, so these are uh, massive astrophysical compact halo objects. And our second, second category are WIMPs. And yeah, these are real acronyms. And WIMPs are weakly interacting massive particles, which uh, I'm not a part of particle physicist, so I'm not too well versed on what these might be. But Ryan very kindly told me before the uh, presentation that they are just some sort of particle that drives the rotation curves of, well, that drives the velocity of a galaxy. So now that we know a little bit about dark matter, we should turn our gaze to dark energy. And dark energy is another one of those things where people much smarter than I do are still scratching their heads over. But if you think you have an idea, come speak to me after the presentation. Uh, I will do the right thing and pay for your Uber to the airport when I go win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> And basically, same as dark matter. If we um, if we can't see it, then how on earth do we find it? How on earth do we know it's out there? And this can actually be explained by pretty uh, everyday phenomena. And one of the best examples of that, I promise this gift will be relevant, is when you're standing at the side of the street and you see a car, or well, you hear a car going by, or even better yet, an ambulance. And you know how when a car goes by, it kind of goes like, yeah. And basically, it kind of goes from being a high pitch to a low pitch. That's something called the Doppler effect. And what the Doppler effect tells us is that when something is moving and it's emitting some sort of wave, a stationary observer will kind of see those waves to either compress or stretch out. So, you know, with a car when it's going like, and it's going away from you, you hear that uh, lower pitch noise because the uh, wavelength of sound is effectively being stretched out. But back to our conversation on dark energy, light does the same thing too. And in the 1920s, uh, astronomer Edwin Hubble, he found uh, that there are galaxies outside of our own. And while this is a pretty profound discovery in, in itself, one particular thing about these galaxies is that they all looked kind of red. And why do we think they looked kind of red? Because they were, they were moving away from us. Yeah, exactly. So when uh, light at higher wavelengths, when it gets stretched out, looks red. And a particular thing about uh, about these galaxies is that not only were they all moving away from us, the ones even the ones further away from us were moving away at a quicker rate. So obviously the galaxy, uh, the galaxy, the universe is expanding and it's expanding at an accelerating rate. So some of you might be asking, well, Frank, that's uh, well saying, uh, Frank, that's not too scary. Uh, what's so scary about dark energy is just something pushing galaxies away from us. Uh, well, for you existentialists out in the audience, dark energy does have some pretty important implications on the fate of our universe. And right now there are three big theories and they are called the big crunch, uh, the big rip, and indefinite expansion, or I've sometimes heard that called being a Peter Allen universe. And I'll start with that one because it's got the most boring name. 
But uh, basically, in a Peter out, a Peter out universe depends on the balance between dark energy and matter. And this isn't just dark matter, it's all forms of matter. And if you have about the same amount of dark energy and matter, the universe will stop, the expansion of the universe will stop accelerating and eventually it will just ex uh, expand at a constant velocity. And it will just continue to expand forever. Now, the more cool sounding phase of the universe, the big crunch and the big rip, let's talk about the big crunch first. It's also dependent on the balance between uh, dark energy and matter. If our universe is going to end in a big crunch, then that means the gravitational forces from our matter is stronger than dark energy. And eventually it will pull everything in towards us and the universe will implode on itself. The big rip is exactly the opposite. That's if dark energy is much stronger than all the gravitational forces in the universe and the, the expansion of the universe will continue to accelerate and eventually it will rip apart space-time as we know it. Just uh, as an interaction, what do you guys hope that, how do you guys hope that our universe will end? If it's crunch. If it's crunch? I actually quite like crunch too, just because I have this romantic idea that if the universe implodes upon itself, it'll re-erupt in another big bang. And that means we get to live our lives over and over, which is great because that means I cannot make mistakes that I've previously made in previous lifetimes. But unfortunately, for all of you who are big fans of the big crunch, uh, I think the current consensus is that dark energy makes up about 70% of our universe. And then dark matter makes up about another 25 or so. And regular matter, as we know it, makes up the remaining five. I think that adds up to 100. Uh, but uh, yeah, so right now it looks like the indefinite expansion or the big rip scenarios are the most likely. But that being said, I'm done. Thank you all so much for listening to my talk. Uh, this, all of this actually done from NASA's uh, Galaxy of Horrors series. There's a lot more cool stuff on there that I didn't have the time to talk about, but if you want to go check it out, I've put the link up there. Can't see all too well. I'm sorry about that. But uh, yeah, they, they they also do talk about several other really cool things. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thank you all so much. Questions? Can you talk about these things? Yeah. Um, probably dark matter, just because, uh, like what, if 30% of our universe is made out of, well, that, okay, say like a, the majority of matter is dark matter and we can't see it, like I don't really like going into a room and not knowing what's there and just, you know, kind of existing, not knowing what most of the universe is made out of, that's pretty scary to me. Say you wave black holes, right? Yes, yes, I do. Um, would it be possible, like, say, say you have like a star with like a significant orbit around a black hole? Um, would the redshift change if it gets closer? And would you use that as a measure? Uh, how this is part of this? Um, that's actually a fantastic question, and that's a kind of a way that we detect exoplanets. So Instead of, a, instead of thinking of it as a black hole and a star kind of system, uh, think of it as an exoplanet orbiting a star. If the exoplanet like goes behind the star, then it's very, very slightly pulling the star away from us. So it will, the light from that star will be redshifted. Now to go back to your question about a black hole and a star, while you don't really see any light coming directly from the black hole, so, it would be pretty hard to tell the right, uh, I mean, any kind of color shift in that. But as for the star, I'm guessing it will be some sort of, some like there will be some sort of color shift, but I just uh, can't really think of my feet right now to tell you what exactly it will be shifted to. Cool. Thank you all so much.
Thank you, Frank. You are both funnier than me and also wearing a onesie. So <laughs> probably just uh, host instead. All right. Um, I would like to take this moment to remind you all about the delicious pink drinks that you can get at the bar. Uh, they really do just taste like pink. So yeah, it still tastes like pink. All right, now we're gonna do you're gonna swipe over with your fingers. Trivia answers. All right, we're gonna find out who the winner is and the answer. All right, let's go. Question one: Planet HD, which NASA dubbed the Slasher Planet, has what spooky characteristic? Hey. It has clouds laced with glass that swirl around at 5,400 miles per hour. Jesus shit, that is, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's horrifying. Question two, now this IC2118, this nebula glows by, look, by reflecting light from the star Rigel. But what is another name for this nebula? It is the Witch Head Nebula. We see some hype in the audience, and I am here for it. Yes. Question three, which of the following is not the name of one of these nebulae? Yes. Ghost Eye Nebula. Ghosts okay. don't have eyes. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, I'm over it. Question four, when does a full moon occur? I thought it was Steve. When the moon is on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. I agree. Question five, this famous image of the Perseus cluster was observed in what part of the electromagnetic spectrum? <laughs> X-ray. Which, like, okay, that kind of makes sense because I feel like x rays are the spookiest part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Why? Vibes. Shut the fuck up. Okay. Question six This image of an object in space was taken by Arecibo Observatory and found to look a bit like a skull. But what is it? It is an asteroid. <laughs> Question seven, what is another name for Nebula NGC 246? The Skull Nebula. Personally, I like all of these skull answers <laughs> for obvious reasons. Question eight, what is shown in the following Hubble Space Telescope image? Hey. A debris disk around the star. Unfortunately, it is not the eye of Sauron. I am sorry for anyone who put that in. Question nine. Question nine. This nebula's distinct shape is caused by stellar radiation and winds blowing out of gas and dust. We all blow out gas. <laughs> what is the nebula called? C. The Black Widow Nebula. In my opinion, it is also the Too Many Legends Nebula. I think if you have to describe something as many legged, it has too many legs. <laughs> We can fight about this in our office tomorrow. Oh. Uh, question 10. Last, but certainly not least. The infamous face on Mars image shows evidence for what on the surface of Mars? <laughs> Aliens. Wait. Honest to God, I thought the answer to this was going to be a pile of rocks. 
I got God in front of all of you. Embarrassing. We are planning in our office tomorrow. <laughs> all right. That is the entirety of the trivia answers. So I know who won. I have the winning ballot right here. Can I get a drum roll? Can I get a spoonier drum roll? Yeah. All right. Tad. Who's Tad? <laughs> The, the show, you're going to meet Micah, who has the cute little mouse ears, and you're going to talk to her about your prize. Or you can do that now. That works too. <laughs> okay. We have one more segment for you guys, though. It's very special. Um, it's not this, it's the costume contest. Wait, so, announcements first. Announcements first. Just kidding. It is this. All right. This was Astronomy on Tap number 52, Halloween themed. I would like to remind you all to please scan the QR code up here. Follow Astronomy on Tap on social media. Donate and learn more about Astronomy on Tap. I would also like to remind you that you can tip me a dollar and I will tip it to the donation box at the end. <laughs> um, I'm still a drag king and I still love your dollar bills. Uh, one follow on social media, if you can prove it, equals one free astronomy on tap sticker and the stickers are very cool. I have one on my water bottle and it is fly. You can also help support the Grand Stafford by buying a drink at the bar, and you can support your bartenders by tipping your bartenders. Also, if we need a drink name for the pink drink, which is why I have not called it anything other than the delicious pink drink this entire time. Um, so there should be, like, you should have been writing pink drink names. Tad did not write a pink drink name. <laughs> you did not listen to us. I hope the rest of you wrote a pink drink name. Tad, next time we're revoking your win. Fair enough. Glad we can agree. All right. Once again, money stuff. A $15 donation gets you an AOT t-shirt and a $10 donation gets you an AOT mug. Like I said earlier, the mugs are dope. Okay, go get a mug. Our next event is November 23rd. So come on out. Right here, same time, same place, different people. It is apparently now time for astronomy picture of the day. Is this new? <laughs> I just haven't been here that long. Damn. All right. The Cocoon Nebula wide uh, field image. Um, I haven't seen this image before. Does anyone else want to comment on it? It's pretty. It's pretty. Yeah, it fucking is. What took it? I don't know. Go to aapod.org to learn more. And get a different picture every day. Oh, is that like? Yeah. Yeah. A pod. Honestly, I've never seen this picture before. I work on um, Supernovae, so I don't get pretty pictures like this. I get like white dots in black and white images of galaxies that are kind of blurry. And we're like, oh yeah, let's turn that white dot into a number that signifies brightness. <laughs> so mm, I've never seen it before. 
All right. And you can talk to the local astronomers. We have both sticks fine and under my sweatshirt, but it's here. But there are a bunch of other people around who also have glow sticks who do not have creepy eyes who you may be more comfortable speaking with. That is the last slide. So now it's time for the costume contest. Um, Kayla is a rather judge. Please come back up here. Both Kayla and I love costumes and makeup, obviously. So that's why we're the judges. That makes us qualify to judge you all on your aesthetics and nothing else. Uh, so if you wore a costume, please come up to the stage. The prize, once again, is a whiskey glass with constellations etched into it. It's pretty dope. Um, why is everyone who is wearing the costume an astronomer? What the fuck? <laughs> Why do I know all of you? <laughs> no. Sass them all out loud. Yeah, it's that cool. It's Yes. Okay, so so my fiance slash partner, he um he's a musician and he has a song named Scrimbo. This I've got a black dog in a sheep costume. And so here are my you know little black ears. You know, black legs, and I'm a sheep. And then he also has a song named Chumba, and she's a little cat who vapes. And so that is what Abby is representing here today. So you're welcome. So, Kayla, my concern about this group costume is I don't know if you judge them as hair or individually. I'm sorry. Yes, let's play. It's all of you taking my yard jobs. <laughs> all right. So, no. For Scrimbo and Chumba. For and in black. Who are? What are you? An accident. Okay, so yeah. Who are you? What? That's cool. It's right here. Yeah, that's it. 
There's nothing else to explain things we've really done.